So good evening, everybody, and um, it's a great pleasure for me. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, lecture with uh, Professor Paul Richards uh, about uh, nothing fun but important, and uh, I think he will give us some insights that we otherwise would not have had about what's happening in West Africa with Ebola and so on. Uh, Paul Richards, who was for many years Professor of Anthropology at University College London, and he also taught across the street at SOAS, the um, Oops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> School of Oriental and African Studies, and is now Professor Emeritus at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, has been working in West Africa, and in particular in Sierra Leone, for, for many years. So, I mean, anybody who comes across Sierra Leone, who does anything remotely uh, intellectual in Sierra Leone, has to relate to Paul Richard's works. And it's been like this forever. I mean, <laughs> since before I started my studies, it's been like this. Yeah, no, not really, but you started to publish on Sierra Leone already in the 1970s. Yeah, and, and, uh, and in the start, in the beginning, uh, 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 Professor Richards' work uh, concentrated on agricultural systems and on community life and on kinship, rice growing in the Mende-speaking areas of Sierra Leone. Unfortunately, um, as the years went by, he had to shift a bit and has written extensively on civil war and violence and the aftermath of war because of the tragedy that unfolded in Sierra Leone for about a decade from the early 90s to the early 2000s uh, and he is now um, it seems maybe shifting focus a little bit again towards the uh, responses to and the uh, ways of dealing with um, the Ebola epidemic which is taking place right now. Um, the reason why we're able to have this uh, meeting is in fact that my friend Helge Wehm, who is a professor emeritus at the political science department, took an initiative a little more than a month ago. Most of us thought that no, it's going to be impossible, we're not going to be able to organize anything in a month. And we sent a mail to Professor Richards and he said that, well, yes, we can make it, not towards the end of, maybe not at the end of October, but maybe in early November I can, I can make it to Oslo. So it's, uh, it's fantastic that we could do this because this is uh, the time when we need to, to learn more about this, not least because the Norwegian government has recently decided to stop foreign aid to Sierra Leone at exactly the time when it is the mo most needed. So hopefully this meeting and the debate afterwards uh, can uh, uh, provide us with some uh, intellectual and moral ammunition uh, in order to perhaps influence the powers that be to reverse that, uh, that decision. Uh, so on that note, uh, Professor Richards, we, we're so happy to have you here and I give the floor to you. We have an hour and a half altogether. Uh, Paul Richards will talk for about maybe 45 minutes, uh, following which we will have a Q&A and discussion. But no, if you thank need you to leave there. early, then feel free to go. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Uh, after that introduction, I think I ought to hand it back to Thomas in the sense that um, some years ago he wrote a book on why anthropologists were not effective anymore as public intellectuals. And impressed by his arguments in that important book, um, I decided to abandon my career as an anthropologist and become not a public intellectual, but at least work on topics that seem to be of public importance. So that was my excuse for shifting away from, um, in the initial instance, shifting away from agriculture into conflict studies. It seemed too important to ignore. Um, and now the excuse, as it were, for shifting terrain again is that, oh, it's not in the right, do I need to shout more? Not, not normally, uh, I'm not normally known for, for is that okay? Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm following this uh, necessity, as it were, of, of uh, showing some interest in um, the present Ebola crisis, uh, partly because this, as I will argue in this presentation, this is an intimately social disease and the epidemiologists are really stretching to understand an intimately social disease. The earlier model which is relevant is indeed the AIDS uh, crisis which was also um, an intimately social disease. Uh, Ebola isn't like the AIDS crisis in that it's not primarily sexually transmitted, 
but it, you, you do have to know about the material culture of domesticity in order to understand where the Ebola risk lies. And this is therefore a, a call to anthropologists worldwide, really, to contribute what they know about those domestic interior settings that they get interested in but no one else uh, writes about. And of course I was always very in, impressed by Mary Douglas. I forget where it was, I read in one of her less celebrated papers. She noted that in English middle class households, if you have guests to dinner and you have two toilets, in our house, it was a working class house, we only had one toilet and it was down the yard at the back of the house. Um, but in this magic world of the middle class to which I was aspiring to join as a student reading early Mary Douglas, I read that the middle class had two toilets, one upstairs and one downstairs, and if you had guests to dinner, uh, the men would always go to the downstairs toilet and the ladies would all, always go upstairs to the upstairs toilet. So having broached that topic, and I understood from that that this is what anthropologists do, they write about toilets and, and <laughs> domestic interiors and so on, um, we're, we're back on that kind of ground tonight. Now my title is a bit of a challenge and the reason will become clear in a moment. It was an attempt to link this to Norwegian government policy, uh, which I didn't know they cancelled aid assistance to Sierra Leone, uh, but they still are in assisting the neighbouring country of Liberia. And recently there was a press announcement in Britain about a $150 million grant by the, by the Norwegian government to, to Liberia for forest conservation. And I want to turn to that after I've given you uh, a brief description of what this terrible disease is and what it's doing, and to make my central argument that it's a disease of family intimacy. We'll come back to the forest in a moment. Um, so this is just the basic brutal description of what happens with uh, Ebola. It's a, it's a virus. Um, it's carried in, uh, probably in fruit bats, but science hasn't established that that is the vector. Uh, these fruit bats are allegedly associated with the forest, but in fact they're very widely found across all uh, districts where there's an abundance of fruit trees, which can mean even suburban environments where people have mango trees and similar. Um, the fruit bats are symptom symptomless when they carry the virus. It's conveyed to certain forest animals, including primates, monkeys and, and um, chimpanzees and so forth. And it's also conveyed to humans. So it's a zoonotic disease. It involves a crossover from wild animals into humans. And part of the story is that, as I will show later on, that there's been huge emphasis on the zoonotic aspect, and it's not actually really a very good explanation of what's going on in West Africa at the moment. So the disease is a so-called hemorrhagic fever, which ends your life if you're unfortunate enough to suffer from this, this terrible disease. It ends your life with your organs uh, hemorrhaging and uh, blood and vomit and diarrhea and so on are the things that cause the breakdown of the body, organ failure and death. It has three phases. Um, the first is simply um, equivalent to malaria. You have a bad headache, you have a high fever. And since malaria is very widespread in Upper West Africa, then it's very difficult to tell in the first stages of the disease whether you've got malaria, which people have all the time, or whether you've got this strange new disease that no one has ever experienced before in this region of Africa, uh, Ebola virus disease. Um, the second phase takes you from your first symptoms to a crisis point at which either you start to develop antibodies to the disease and recover, um, or you continue from that point um, uh, towards your death. Um, the main infection risk is in phase three, which is the crisis point to the recovery or death. And in that phase, um, the body is exuding the, the virus, and contact with blood and other body fluids is the main spreader of the disease. It doesn't aerosol. So it's not a disease you can get through casual contact. Uh, this is widely misunderstood across the globe. And if, if I had a wish, it would be that 
stupid political leaders in all countries from Australia to the United States would wise up a bit on the actual facts of Ebola. President Obama has given the lead here by telling some of the US state governors that they ought to actually read a bit about Ebola and find out that it is not like flu. So you're not going to get it on the subway. Peter Pio, the Belgian virologist who first identified and I think named uh, the virus, said on television in Britain recently, he would not, he's now the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he was quoted on television as saying he would not object to sitting next door in the next seat to um, an Ebola sufferer on the London Underground, provided they were not vomiting over him at the time. Um, even that, I checked up on vomit, because if you look on the website of the journal Science, you'll find they've helpfully listed all the papers on Ebola virus disease, which have been made public domain papers by all the journals that have published them. So you can freely download them. And you can actually go through a checklist of what is known scientifically about viral load in various presumed infection factors. So if you want to know about spit, urine, diarrhea, vomit, and so on, you can actually get the scientific evidence. For vomit, there is one study with a sample of one, and it turned out that the vomit was negative for Ebola. Now, I wouldn't recommend necessarily that you'd conclude from that that vomit is not infectious. Um, but even so, it is remarkable that one of the problems that we're dealing with is that so little is known about this disease. A lot is known about the virus because there was um, Cold War weapons research. If you look in your Wikipedia, you'll quickly find your way to the article Weaponized Ebola. And that was all done in these secret establishments in the Soviet Union, Britain at Port and Down um, in the United States. And we know a great deal about how you might make a bomb out of Ebola, but we don't actually know very much at all about the risks associated with different infection pathways in, in terms of what you need to do if you're nursing an Ebola patient to stay risk-free. So that's one of the, the, the major bottlenecks in understanding and preventing Ebola that we just simply lack the common everyday household knowledge about how to protect from Ebola in that phase three. Um, and the reason I say it's a disease of family intimacy is phase three is that part of the disease's course when you lose all contact with help other than that provided either by dedicated medical professionals or by your family. If you live in a city and you can get to a hospital, then dedicated professionals may be able to help you. But if you live in a far off village, and I shall show you some data on how far off in a small country like Sierra Leone some of the villages really are, then your only chance of any kind of help and comfort or, or relief in that last phase of the sickness is if your family stands by you. Last night I saw a BBC broadcast the village with Ebola where there was an old man who was standing by his wife. It was thought that she had Ebola. There's no sure test for Ebola that comes back within 48 hours. You have to take a blood sample and send it off to a laboratory. The laboratory has to have electricity and you get the result, if you're lucky, in 48 hours. So it's very difficult to decide who does and does not have Ebola. But it was a likelihood in this case because this village had several Ebola cases. And this old man was standing by his wife, which is absolutely splendid. He was determined to nurse her even if it killed him. But he turned to the TV and he said, but where's the help? He was struggling with plastic bags to protect himself. He knew he needed to protect himself. He had no protection other than what he could improvise. And this is a point I'll come back to later because I think it's a central issue to do with the uh, current epidemic and what the, the world needs to, um, shall we say, make some crucial decisions about. And those decisions have not yet been made, how, even though we're well on into the progress of this terrible epidemic. Um, so that's why I say getting the health message is a ma right is a major challenge um, because it's um, an issue for families. That requires health messages to have a blunt discussion of orifices, discharges, and cleaning routines. And these are not easy conversations to have. If sex is difficult to talk about in public, cleaning up the orifices of a dead body 
are even harder to talk about. There is no language, even in anthropology. We've got lots of language to talk about the symbolism of funerals, but we do not have language to talk about cleaning up mess. Um, and one of the key issues is safe, safe preparation of bodies for burial. And later on I'm going to say a bit more about that because there's a, a lot of confusion in this area about what is a ritual, and anthropologists are supposed to know about rituals, and it is supposed that African peoples have strange funeral rituals which are spreading the disease. I don't believe this is true. I believe what, what is true is that in West Africa, unlike in Norway, there is no professional undertaker service in the villages. Undertaking, the work that is done by an undertaker is done by the family. And that certainly is a risk point. And we need to start to talk about it and how to reduce the, the risk. Um, so I've drawn the parallel with HIV AIDS, which was a disease of sexual intimacy, whereas I'm arguing that Ebola virus disease is a disease of family intimacy. And correct messages about reducing risk to carers have been obscured, and they've been obscured specifically by an obsession. It seems at times it's an obsession by media and agencies dealing with Ebola on forests and bushmeat. So I've already made the point that Ebola is a zoonotic disease, but here comes the big, big but. Even if that first case, the index case as they call it, in the language of the epidemiologists, if that first case was a zoonotic transfer, it seems quite unlikely that it was the direct consumption of bushmeat because the first case was a two-year-old child. And the index case was a village called Meliandu in the Republic of Guinea in December 2013. And Meliandu, you can check for yourself on Google Earth, is a village within the peri-urban fringe of Gekadu, which is a city of about 200,000 uh, people. There's a bush road leading to Meliandu. Probably every day people are walking up and down that road or riding motorbike taxis into uh, Gekadu buying and selling produce. And the disease quickly spread from that two-year-old to the village nurse who was coping with the child's uh, illness. And then she was hospitalized and it spread through the hospital system. One of the f major factors in the spread of Ebola virus disease in West Africa, you take two things together. One is that Ebola virus disease has never been seen in that region before. So no one knew what it was. And it was a long time before the government of Guinea reported to the World Health Organization that they had Ebola in Guinea. Um, missed my point. There was a second point there. Never number your points, I've learned in giving lectures, because you always forget the second one. Um, no, no, the second one is it then spread very quickly through the medical care system, it went from hospital to hospital as more and more medical workers got infected and then they got rushed off to the next best level of the, the next higher level in the hospital system. And, and Gwekadu in any case is on the main road system. I think it's called the N1 uh, in the Republic of Guinea. So there's vehicles going all the time down to the capital city. And people in West Africa are very mobile on modern transport and the roads have got a lot better. This is part of the story in Sierra Leone that post-war, the international community has come and built, the European Union especially, has come and built a lot of beautiful roads in Sierra Leone, which means you can get right across the country in just a few hours. And people travel, and they travel looking for help when they're sick. But more importantly, if we go back to the previous slide, if you look at the three phases, the first symptoms are simply headache and fever. And you're, you're symptomless for the first two or three days after you've been infected. So if you take the first phase and those two or three days, you've got about four or five days in which people will simply go about their normal business without realizing that they've got anything seriously wrong with them. They might think it's just a passing bout of malaria. Uh, and they can travel a long way in the four or five days. The other point is that I'll show you on the map in a moment that the area... Um, Perhaps I can walk through the map obscuring your view. Um, I'll put my finger on uh, Meliandu, which is just here. Uh, Gekadu is in this gap in the forest. And then, um, no, sorry, it's here. And uh, then this is the uh, extension of Sierra Leone in, in, into Guinea, as it were. There's a very big international market 
place called Koindu. Um, the markets in this part of West Africa are interesting because in the 19th century, as you came in from the coast, the slave trade had destroyed all normal forms of commerce up to about this level in, in West Africa. But here you were far enough from the coast to be out of the range of the coastal traders who were selling human beings to North America or South America in return for beads and trinkets and similar. Um, but when you got beyond this level, you got into the sort of real interior African economy and people had markets and they had currency. And this area is called the, the Kisi people live right across the borders in the three countries in Liberia, Sierra Leone and um, Guinea. And the currency that they used in the old days were so-called Kisi pennies and you could convert them in your local blacksmith's workshop. You could convert them into a useful object like a hoe blade or something if you wanted, or you could continue to trade on with your, your kissy pennies. So this is part of the historical mercantile zone of African trade, which means it's out of the reach of the colonial trade stations on the coast, or the slave trade stations on the coast. This is part of the dense network of pathways and routeways and trading ways that go up into this, the, the Niger Valley, the upper Niger Valley in Guinea, onwards into Mali, even the Saharan trade, sort of took its origins from here. Um, you can get, along the Gola Forest in Liberia, you get a lot of gold mining, and that gold goes up historically, it went up into Mali, and it still does go up, up into Mali. A lot of it is involved in trans-Saharan trade. So there's pathways linking people from this area right across to the interior of Africa. And I think this was not recognized by a lot of the agencies that first tried to grapple with the Ebola crisis because there have been 27 outbreaks of Ebola in Africa since 1974, I think it was that Ebola was first identified. And they've all been in low population density districts, uh, which are not densely networked by trade. Whereas this area is part of the crossroads of Africa. The, the fact is it just happens to be on the edge of a part of the surviving part of the Upper Guinean forest here is just accidental um, because it's densely linked in to all sorts of trading networks, including to the coastal cities, but also right up into Mali and into the Sahara. Um, so it was a very bad place for Ebola to break out. If it broke out of the forest at that point, that was a really unfortunate place for it to break out because it very, very quickly got into uh, human networks. And most of the transmission uh, is human to human. There was a paper published about three months back um, which did a molecular analysis on all cases in Sierra Leone from the first recorded cases, which I think were in April through to July, and every case up to that point, and probably since, was human-to-human -human transmission. Even though Sierra Leoneans do live right next to the forest, and they do do a great deal of bushmeat hunting, and there is a great deal of bushmeat consumption, none of the Sierra Leonean cases are related to those factors. And yet, if you walk through Sierra Leone, up until probably four weeks ago, maybe still it's the case, you would encounter public messages about Ebola is spread by eating bushmeat, don't eat bushmeat, etc., etc. The tragedy with that is that a lot of people said, we don't know what Ebola is, we don't even believe that it exists, it's maybe if it exists it's American germ warfare, but if it, if it, if it, if it does exist, I'm not going to get it because I'm a good Muslim and I don't eat monkeys, so I'm not at risk. There was a CAP survey done in seven districts of Sierra Leone with a sample of 1,300 informants. And they were asked, what is the cause of Ebola? And the single most understood message in Sierra Leone in September was that bushmeat is the cause of Ebola. And you might laugh and say, well, it doesn't matter. But it does matter if, people are, if their behavior is based on the assumption that it's to do with bushmeat and they feel protected because they don't eat bushmeat. Now, this takes us therefore to the forest and whether Ebola is in any useful sense regarded as a forest disease. So I quote to you a headline from the um, Guardian newspaper in Britain on the 25th of September, Norway to give Liberia 150 million to fight illegal logging that may spread Ebola. 
Well, I've said enough to say that that's, that's nonsense. The, the article went on to say some scientists speculate, at least they use the right words, speculate, that deforestation may be linked to the disease. Um, I've called that illegal logging disease. Why I thought illegal started with an E, I don't know, just old age, I suppose. Um, but anyhow, because it, the Ebola virus disease, the acronym is EVD, I've called illegal logging disease ELD for no very good reason. Um, it may be endemic in Liberia because we know that large parts of the civil war in Liberia, people like, uh, um, sorry, just my mind has blanked. Sorry? No, I'm, I'm looking at him right now and I've, my, my mind has gone. Morton Bush um, has written about the causes of the Liberian civil war and rightly identifies, sorry about that, uh, mentioning old age made my mind go old. Um, uh, Morton has written about the Liberian Civil War quite extensively and includes good evidence that logging was one of the things that paid for the Civil War and um, it is indeed true that a large part of Charles Taylor's personal fortune that funded his regime, if that's what you want to call it, um, was paid for by illegal deforestation. Um, but this isn't in any plausible sense, according to the evidence we have so far, linked to the spread of Ebola virus disease. In the Liberian case, but it probably applies to Guinea and Sierra Leone as well, the external orientation of Liberian elites has undermined local health service provision. Uh, it's too easy for the elite to fly overseas to get help in an American hospital or a British hospital or wherever. And um, local health service provision has been chronically underfunded and hospitals are in a very poor condition. And Ebola has been spread by these underfunded, understaffed, ill-equipped health services. And there is a word which I'd uh, long practiced and again my mind has blanked it out. Nosocomial transmission is a technical term for the infection that you get when you go into hospital. My granny was of a generation that feared to go to hospital because the one thing that happened in the hospital was you got infected with a disease you hadn't come in with. You'd, God would heal you from the disease you did have, but you would die of whatever it was you picked up from the, your fellow patients. Uh, that's very largely the story of the spread of Ebola, especially in the early phases of the epidemic. And it's partly to do with the chronic um, state of under preparation of the health services in the region. So there is a lot of recognition of that now that when Ebola is conquered, as I'm sure it will be, um, something needs to be done uh, by the international community to help create fit for purpose medical care systems that reach the poorest of the poor in these three countries and probably beyond in West Africa. Um, uh, the reason I put this map up is that um, it's part of the evidence that Ebola virus disease is not, in any practical sense in Sierra Leone or in Liberia, um, a forest-based epidemic. Um, because these are, this is a map of the villages where we've worked <coughs> over the last three or four years collecting data on both sides of the border, on both sides of the Gola forest. And in both those regions, there's a remarkable lack of Ebola. Malama Chieftain, which is this cluster in the, in the north, um, of Sierra Leone, north of the Gola North Forest Reserve, um, the local authorities acted very quickly to quarantine themselves. They stopped people coming in because their perception of the disease was not that the, the hazard came from the forest, which they live with every day. They thought the disease was coming from the main road system. So they stopped people coming, the Paramount Chief stopped people coming into Malama Chieftain. And I think to this day, they've, they've hardly got any cases in that area. The lowest case load in Liberia is in Barpolo County, which is this area, immediately to the east of the Gola Forest in Liberia. And again, it, it's isolation. Barpolo isn't, to my knowledge, self-quarantined, but it, it, it's quarantined by the completely impossible state of the road communications. Um, the bridges fall down and you, you go in but you don't come out kind of thing. You're there for the rest of the, the rainy season if you're foolish enough to take your vehicle across the, one of these bridges. Anyhow, Esther can tell you more because she's worked in all those villages and knows just truly how appalling the roads are. And that has protected uh, Barpolo District. Again, it's evidence that it's not associated with the forest. 
There's no onward transmission. There's no repetitive transmission from wildlife to humans uh, because the districts closest to the forest that have got the worst communications have got the least uh, load of Ebola. Um, the epicenter I've talked about is this Kissy area which is shared, the Kissy people spread into three countries and densely networked. The Kissy people have never really accepted colonialism. I was in one Kissy village with my Kissy colleague, the late Malcolm Jusu, uh, Sandy Alu, um, in the Sierra Leonean part of Kissy. And um, he lodged me in his uh, grandfather's house and um, he told me about his grandfather after we'd eaten in the evening. And he said his grandfather had three settlements. Uh, this one, Sandialu, in Sierra Leone. He had another settlement of which he was the chief in Liberia. And he had a third settlement of which he was the chief in Guinea. So when the tax collectors came from Sierra Leone, he just simply moved to Liberia. And if any Liberian tax collectors ever made it that far up into the um, interior, then he would decamp into Guinea, and if the French were coming chasing him for tax, he would come back to Sierra Leone. And that sense of Kissy identity as a kind of cross-border um, anti-colonial uh, society still lives today. So people, uh, it was unfortunate that the f first outbreak was in that region that is so densely networked across the three countries, and that gave a foothold to the disease in all three countries. Um, and as I say, in this third point, disease has spread mainly along roads through market centers and towards the capital cities. Um, but then I'm going to talk about the local hotspots um, because one of the things that people did in the early days when they fell sick of this mysterious disease they couldn't understand, they abandoned modern health care as not being able to offer them anything of uh, any value and some people then went it deep into the bush looking for indigenous cures, some of them magical. And these, the search for local cures and then funerals that followed from people who died of the disease created rural hotspots for the disease. So there's in the paper that we've written on this, which is so, sort of lives in a limbo land, it's on the website of the journal Public Library of Science, Neglected Tropical Diseases, a plus NTD if you want a more convenient label. Um, they've had great difficulty getting this paper reviewed because it's on social aspects of Ebola and why they didn't turn to some regular anthropologists to review it, I don't know. Uh, but what they've said is all the people they've sent it to for review are too busy with the Ebola crisis to, to review our paper. So we said, yeah, but we thought this paper, you know, we've written it at high speed saying something we think is of value uh, to the agencies. A lot of people have read it online when we posted it to them and so forth. And they said, yeah, we ought to do something about it. So we'll put it on our website, on a blog page, with a banner above it that says, this, we intend to publish this in the journal, provided it passes peer review. <laughs> so here it is meanwhile, and please look for updates, because if it's a load of rubbish, we will tell you. Uh, so we're waiting with bated breath to find out the fate of our paper. But it is there for you to read, if you would like to read it at all. <coughs> Anyhow, in that, we define the notion of a rural-urban pendulum effect. And uh, Ebola virus disease in Sierra Leone has defied epidemiological modeling because it's a disease of family intimacy and there's not much... Most epidemiological models don't actually have much in the way of family intimacy built into them. Um, and transmission is often the result of home nursing in that last phase of the disease and family activity around burial, especially corpse preparation. Um, but the other key factor behind the rural urban and pendulum effect is that after the Civil War in Sierra Leone, the Civil War brought a lot of country people to the town for the first time. And they didn't all go back. Some of them did, some of them didn't. We've got data across 47 randomly sampled chieftains in Sierra Leone of what people locally estimate the population change to have been from before to after the Civil War, immediately after, and then 10 years later. And consistently across the country, people estimate that only about 80% of all those who left because of the Civil War have come back. Um, so you have divided rural families, and often it's because actually development is moving, the economy is improving, um, schools are located in, rural, in urban areas, 
Um, people send their children to secondary school in urban areas. That creates a lot of movement between villages and the peri-urban fringe of Freetown, for example, where a lot of the houses of the new, formerly rural, but now urban poor live. So there's a lot of kids coming out to the village to collect food and bringing it back to the family rather lean-to kind of um, shack residence in the peri-urban fringe around Freetown. Um, and there's a lot of other movements so that, it, for example, it's a, a lot of this peri-urban land is land that is being bought for future uh, housing development. So the rich people that buy the land then want a caretaker on the land. So they will send for someone trustworthy from their own family in the village and they'll build a little pan body shed that acts as a temporary home. And that's where a lot of the people are living in the fringes of Freetown at the moment. And later I'll show you some data to show that that's really where now the focus of the epidemic is in, in Sierra Leone. Um, so that just gives you, that, that's in our paper and it's now outdated because 26th of September is a long, long time ago in terms of the Ebola epidemic. But it does show that this is the, the region where the virus first came into the country and then you can more or less see it moving across to Freetown and then spreading back into some of the peri-urban areas close to Freetown, rather disguised by the fact that Port Lockwood district, you know, you you colour the whole area grey, but a lot of the cases around Lungi Airport and on the road out from Lungi and on this road up to uh, a mile 47 and so on. So I'm asking the question, is Ebola virus disease, I've, now this is a word I've seen, but I, I don't like it, but it, it's useful in the context, to define this transitional zone between rural and urban. Uh, where largely rural people are living, but they're living for reasons of access to urban facilities or access to urban markets to be able to sell stuff and so on. Um, and I'm raising the question whether Ebola is particularly a disease of these urban areas around Freetown and other large cities. And I think the same argument, I don't have data on um, Guinea and uh, Liberia, but I think the same argument would apply to Monrovia and to um, Conakry as well. And uh, this spread of disease into these urban areas has been facilitated by good roads in the case of Sierra Leone. The emergence after the war of a new phenomenon, a lot of ex-combatants self-demobilized by getting a higher purchase contract for a motorcycle which they could then run as a taxi. and. Um, this has hugely facilitated um, access to markets in rural areas and the customers of these bike riders are, well everyone is a customer of these bike riders but particularly it's liberated women to enter into the markets and rural periodic markets are emerging everywhere and there's a whole forest of these bikes that have brought women to the market to sell things and take them back when they're buying second hand clothing and so on. Um, so there's a great intensification of rural-urban contact. Um, and whereas the first phase of the disease was primarily within the three-country epicenter in Kisiland, there's been now a second phase of the epidemic with intensive spread on the peri-urban fringe of the three capitals. And here's some data to uh, mull over. I'm nearly at the end now, but um, now some facts and figures. This is from the latest uh, situation report from the Ministry of Health and Sanitation in Sierra Leone, um, listing the confirmed Ebola virus disease cases from May the 23rd to the 30th of October. So it's, it's nearly up to date. And what I've done is I've standardized uh, for six districts, I've standardized the cases per thousand. So you can see the epicenter up there which is quite high, one of the highest in the country, 1.18 Ebola virus disease cases per thousand of population. Um, you come down to Freetown, Western Urban, uh, which is a densely populated uh, district with close packed slums. Some of the uh, classic slums of the literature on slums uh, East Freetown and so on. That actually has rather a low rate. Everyone thought 
you know, when that disease gets into East Freetown, there will be a huge number of Ebola cases. It's not true. Now look, Western Rural, which is this area, the peri-urban fringe of Freetown, it goes all the way out to about, uh, it goes to a place called Waterloo, which is actually the capital of Western Rural, which is at the end of the Sierra Leone Peninsula, and even further on into the countryside. Um, and in those urban areas, as I call them, the caseload is 1.87 way above even the epicenter rate of infections. So there's no doubt that now the core of the epidemic in Sierra Leone is in this urban periphery of Freetown. Here's a picture of an Akada rider, the local name for the motorcycle taxi. Um, that's, I've just made that point. Um, so our working hypothesis is that the rural ur urban pendulum effect is the single biggest driver of the spread of the disease. And uh, so a few factors about why Ebola virus disease has become so entrenched so quickly. Reasons include uh, inappropriate information. I've discussed the bushmeat factor, the underfunded and ill-equipped medical services. A top-down approach to control. Um, I was in a meeting with DFID's advisory group on Ebola last week. Um, one of the people in charge of the British response in assisting Sierra Leone to cope with the Ebola virus disease epidemic said, we have spent far too much time telling people about the causes of Ebola and not enough time listening. And I thought, well, that's, that's a great improvement. We're six months into the epidemic, but, you know, it's better late than never. Um, so we've told them how the disease spreads. In the early days, we told them badly because we told them all this nonsense about bushmeat and so on. Um, now we're telling them the correct message, but we're telling them. We're instructing them what to do. Whereas when you're instructing people how to manage the most intimate parts of a family disease, it, you're not going to listen to the government if they tell you how to empty your slot pan or clean your toilet or how to wash dead bodies, that's not what you expect. Well, wh where's the language for a start? You know, still, they can't mention certain words in public when describing which orifices of the body are uh, highly infective. Um, so basically, you have to explain the transmission pathways and then listen very carefully to people how they discuss among themselves how they're going to deal with this and what solutions they come back with. There's a specific reason why that's very important because of the widespread importance of so-called secret societies in Sierra Leone in rural life. And the Sande Society, the Women's Society, is a society that specializes in knowledge relating to certain orifices of the body and certain processes like birthing. Um, and the Sunday Society buries its elders with great secrecy. And asking about those burial ceremonies is just a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for driving people into hiding their bodies and, and just telling you to go and take a running jump. What you can do, which is what Esther's doing, and she may be willing to say a bit more about this later, is you can talk to people about the nature of the disease risk because you need to correct this misperception it's all about bushmeat and get to the real last two days of the disease and how you clean up after someone who is vomiting and has diarrhea and so on and all the health risks of handling dirty bedding uh, without protecting yourself, uh, washing a, a dead body without protecting yourself and so on. You can hand over that information and then say to people, okay, go away and discuss it and you come up with your own suggestions about what help you need, uh, what you need is to help, what you need the international community or the, the national health services to help you with in order to cope more safely. If you can start to reduce the risk uh, of these transition events, super spreader events that are called by some of the epidemiologists like body washing in preparation for funerals, if you can, if you can reduce the risk over terminal nursing by having a one-on-one -on -one nursing arrangement. So you say to families, look, if you think you've got an Ebola case, let just one person nurse that person. Put them in a separate room and let only one person, not four of you going and showing solidarity and expressing sympathy and so on, just one person nurse. Let them be equipped with things that will help, 
sweat bands maybe for the forehead because a lot of people wipe their when they've been doing heavy work wipe their forehead without thinking and the sweat will run the virus down into your eyes and the eyes are a major infection pathway you know simple things like that that can be done to protect against the disease it won't protect people completely you can't guarantee 100 percent that that one person doing the nursing won't eventually die of the disease as well but it does stop it just being a one at that point it's only a one-to-one -one transmission the other people show solidarity to that one wonderful volunteer by providing everything that they need all the meals are cooked all the water is fetched and so on but you don't actually go in with the patient um, if you can introduce that and get people to accept that or to work out their own variants because we're finding that a lot of people are doing that already they're developing their own quarantine procedures if there's a big push on that then you could really start to reduce the risk at both ends so the international response is needed the the big centers that are run by MSF and others in the cities that's very important and no one is saying don't do that but nothing at the moment has been decided about what to do at the in situ level and if you talk to some medics they say there isn't going to be anything called home care because home care is too dangerous yeah but then what do you do because there's plenty of people now let me show you I've talked about um, uh, burials enough I think um, because it is a major spreader and this I'll cut because um, it's about how people some of our data on how people trust their families as the last it basically says the family is the last resort if you have a really serious problem then you don't rely on outsiders you don't rely on government institutions you rely on the family um, and the trouble with the current model for Ebola virus disease control is that it's central um, the British are talking about establishing four or five main quarantine centers and then local triage posts. Even at best, there'll only be 149 for each one for each chieftain. And it still depends on a very slow blood test. So uh, an alternative is this voluntary qu quarantine and the one-on-one -on -one carer setup. Um, voluntary, voluntary quarantine isn't encouraging. The, the reason the medics fear this is because they think, oh, if you start talking about home care, then people will think they can cope at home and they won't send people along to the Ebola centers. What we've said is in many cases, people won't go to the Ebola centers in any case because they're just too far off. And this is my last set of evidence on this because we have data um, from our national survey that I mentioned earlier from 47 uh, chieftains randomly sampled, um, more than 2,500 households. And we've uh, estimated from that data set the average travel times to medical help well connected villages are villages on roads with already established government facilities like agribusiness centers and even at that you still find there's a significant number of villages where it takes from two hours to half a day to walk to the nearest um, facility um, if you live in a what we call here an off-site village somewhere back in the bush in that same chiefdom you find that there's, another, there's, a, there's a significant peak at the two, two hour to half a day distance. And then if you're on, in a real far off forest edge village, you get a really huge peak. And some people are taking a full day um, to reach um, any significant medical help of the kind that's being currently promised. So what we've said is it takes a healthy person a whole day to reach one of your triage centers, which is the point where you then get an Ebola test to find out whether you've really got Ebola, then you get moved on to one of these centralized Ebola facilities. How's that going to happen if you're in the last three days? If you don't know you've got Ebola until the last three days, you think you've just got bad malaria and a bad headache, and then you find, God forbid, that you've got Ebola in the eruptive phase, you're not going to be walking a day to seek help which means you've got to get four people in a hammock to transport you and that's four people who are at risk of catching the disease so we said in any case we know that village people make very strategic difficult assessments they say this patient is too ill to seek medical attention either it's too late or it's going to be too expensive um, and they make rational choices that it's better for the person to die where they are than to try and move them to get medical health and help in a place that they're not confident they will even get the help to begin with. So there's a real problem with isolated hotspot areas. And that could be solved, or it could, not solved, but it could be made a lot better by developing a protocol which reduces risk 
and helps people develop their own ideas about risk reduction in situ. Uh, and that's the missing part of the Ebola puzzle that we all need to work on at the moment. And I think that's where anthropologists can really be of help. So I've said um, the epidemiological models, this is the conclusion, are all over the place. Predictions vary from the epidemic ending over the coming dry season to millions of deaths by the end of 2015. The models will get better, but probably only when anthropologists and others provide better data on key topics, such as family nursing and burial procedures. Special attention is now needed to break the urban infection chain. Uh, the existing top-down model is not adequate, and some effort is needed to develop in situ uh, equipment and advice. A key issue is the speed with which local populations are learning to understand transmission pathways and ways to protect themselves. We're finding out more all the time that this is actually beginning to happen and it's probably helping cause downturns in infection in all three countries. And no one knows whether, they all, whether already these downturn figures are examples of local unsupervised learning um, or whether they're just people hiding cases and not reporting them. But there's enough, I, th I think the weight of the evidence now is shifting towards the idea that there is some local learning going on that hasn't been properly recorded and it is having a positive effect in reducing the epidemic and there are some interesting and positive anecdotal instances of this um, but anyhow that's the end we can talk about some examples if you want later on um, so I've argued the case then that uh, we need to understand the disease better from an anthropological perspective and that uh, hard work by anthropologists is now needed in helping support some of these local adaptive uh, initiatives. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Paul. If you'd like to sit here, I'll sit here and try to chair the discussion. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but um, why don't I just start with one? Um, because one of the issues that I've also been discussing a lot with our PhD student Robert Papers, who also works in rural Sierra Leone and returned from feedback last summer, is the uh, uh, problem of trust. I mean, uh, largely, I mean, because of the experience of the civil war, but, but also because of, as you, as you showed yourself, I mean, the long history of uh, having a fraught relationship with all kinds of authorities. So why should they trust anybody at all when they give medical advice? Because you have the solutions now. I mean, you mentioned a few things that people can actually do, but how can we make them do it when they don't trust us or they don't tr even trust each other or their own authorities? Um, I, I think that analysis is correct and I probably, if there'd be more time, I'd have said a little bit about the legacy of the slave trade. Um, which is one of the reasons that why people so easily believe strange sto stories that may seem strange to you about MSF and other good-hearted volunteers being in Sierra Leone only to steal body parts. You know, the, the, there is a literature for those of you who are anthropologists, I'm sure you know it better than I do, on vampirism and model, modern development, capitalist development as, as, a, as a kind of scene from below. It often seems to have the, the characteristics of a vampire economy. And Karl Marx said as much with his notion of commodity fetishism and so on uh, many years ago. Uh, but the slave trade made it very severe in West Africa, the capacity to b believe in vampire models. Um, and of course, there's an open argument among anthropologists about whether vampire models are just myths and superstitions or whether indeed they are quite good models of what actually goes on in terms of human exploitation. Let me just give you a quick example. Um, there was a paper published in, in July uh, by a group of American army doctors who come to Kenema in Sierra Leone to re-examine perfectly legitimate projects, and thank God they did it. It's a very interesting piece of work. Uh, but they came to Sierra Leone to look at the, the blood samples that have been collected by the Lhasa Fever Project in Sierra Leone in the middle first decade of the 21st century. And they reanalyzed them. There's some dispute about whether their technique was good enough to the conclusion that they developed, but they found, interestingly, that they, they had, there were antibodies to Ebola in 10% of those samples, which would indicate that the Ebola virus had been around in the region, unreported, unrecognized, for a lot longer than the, the present outbreak. 
Now, they're American Army doctors. They come to take blood from the Lhasa Fever Hospital. One of the authors of the paper was at that moment dying of, of, of Ebola, um, Dr. Khan, who's a Sierra Leonean, greatly lamented. Um, and he's listed quite properly as one of the authors of the paper, but it's with a little cross against it to indicate that he's deceased. Um, when you know that Dr. Khan was a very popular doctor, when you know that he's been involved with this group of American army doctors who are re-examining these blood samples, and that, and that rumor spreads around the streets of Kenema, it doesn't take long for people to interpret that this is germ warfare. You know, these Americans are coming on a military purpose and it's to kill Sierra Leoneans or test out some weaponized Ebola. Um, far more silly myths are believed in Europe and North America than that one because that's actually you know, quite well founded on 90% of the information that they needed to draw the correct conclusion. So it's not completely stupid that people tried to burn down the Kenema, Kenema Ebola treatment facility at that point because they really were deeply convinced that this was a malicious plot. Um, so the, the issue of trust between uh, local populations and intervening agencies um, dates back to the days of the slave trade when even market forces came in the, for, the form of a slave trader who might abduct you, ca capture you. A lot of the slave trade in Sierra Leone was by kidnapping. It wasn't by open warfare. Um, and so the experience of people disappearing without trace, people say about Ebola that the, the, the sick person is, is seized and taken into one of these facilities and they never hear about them again. That could be easily dealt with by putting track and trace electronic bracelets on each patient to make sure that you know people can find out where their loved ones have gone but they were being buried without record the families were not being not notified so the issue of trust became really huge at that point and people have been swimming upstream ever since to try and rebuild some trust but there wasn't much trust to begin with so this is I would say this is one of the major issues of the current Ebola crisis in all three countries is this breakdown of the very low trust that existed to begin with which has become even worse because of these rather hectic international um, interventions thank you questions Oh, I see. Yes, yes, please. So just give a sign. Whoever wants to ask a question. Oh, yes, there's a gentleman at the back. So if we can uh, manage to get a microphone, or if you can speak up. Uh. Hello, hi. Uh, thank you very much for a very rather interesting presentation. I'm a Salyan and myself, I, I, I haven't been there for <laughs> over 25 years, but uh, was there, I was there in March now and came back in uh, April just before. But uh, my question is, it's, it's uh, quite some interesting um, uh, data here you've shown, but of course the main issue is how can we uh, start to uh, turn the curve, and this issue of trust uh, uh, is one issue which you've addressed. But I got very depressed uh, with the numbers in the villages. Um, do you see a role for the paramount uh, chiefs uh, and the tribal heads in this uh, in these remote uh, remote areas? Um, from an answer when it comes to trust, are these people that can be? Uh, use in the front line, the paramount chiefs and the tribal heads in these areas? The quick answer is yes. And uh, I'm going to ask whether Esther will say something about this because she's daily in contact by telephone with some of these chiefs and elders in villages. Trying, we're trying to work out a pilot program that would actually put some flesh on the bones of the model you've just sketched. So let me hand over to Esther to talk about the role of elders and chiefs in helping create a viable local model of a disease prevention. <laughs> okay, I will try to say something. He has said everything, so I don't have to repeat uh, what he has said, really. Um, uh, yes, the chiefs are very important. 
to involve them, the local people there in the, as South Paul said about uh, the secrets. Because West, West, not only Syrian unions, the West Africa, all the African countries, we lack trust and we have secrecy. Even here, you have uh, youth clubs where if you are not a member, you are outsiders. So by involving these chiefs, the paramount chiefs, the local chiefs, they are very important. So because they are ruling the people, they know how their families are, they know what is happening in the community, they are highly respected. But if they are not involved, it's a bottom up process to, to solve the Ebola system. So I think the, the, the chiefs are very, very important. Because if the chiefs are involved, we've won the war. Because this is a war, not only for international people. I'm a village girl. I came from the village. I live in the village. I've been working with the village. I've been in most of these communities. You go to these communities, they are, well, they are really isolated. You have to walk eight hours. You cross rivers. And to the time you are, you've reached in this community, you are what? The first person you have to meet is the chief. As soon as I get into the community, I say, where is the chief? The chief is over there. If the chief is in the farm, I walk there. We respect them. We respect the culture. If we, if we involve the chiefs, not only the chiefs, the local, the youths, the secret people. This, the, let me say, when I, when I say the secret people, the societal people, where you have the men's society, the women's society, the women are more involved in this. I don't have a... a a data on this, that how many women are involved who are affected with this um, um, disease. Because when you are in the village or any community, when you are sick, the women has to do, take control. They have to do the cleaning, do the, kick, the cooking and everything. And they, when the person is sick, the, the women has to do all the cleaning up and so forth. So I'm now trying to involve the women. So the, I've tried to talk to the chiefs. I have a village, we are in a, it's, a, it's my pilot village. We are in, I've asked the chief, they are aware of the sickness. I phoned the, the chief, I said, how is my village? And they said, oh, we are Auntie Esther, we are very scared. I said, about what? I know what is happening. Because that's how we have to meet the people. I want them to tell me what is it. I don't want to say, oh, have you heard about Ebola? They will tell me what I want to know. That's why we have to involve the then they told me that, yes, we have heard about Ebola. And then I said, Ebola, what is Ebola? Then they tried to tell me. I said, how do you feel about it? Say, Auntie Esther, we are scared here. I said, very good. Very good. When they are scared, that means they are aware of what is happening with them. So I said, well, what are we going to do? I said, can you remember when I was in your community, what we did? We are in, I put all the, the Jews one side, the children one side, the women one side, the elders one side. I said, I want you to have that meeting. I want you to go to various meetings. Let them discuss, really, how are we going to get rid of this disease? It's a fight. So they said, OK, we are going to do this. Then the chief said, oh, Auntie Esther, I'm going now right now to the next village and tell my, 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 my mates, that is the other chiefs, what they have to do. So he went to two villages. I said, don't go yet, because it's a pilot. I said, try it first. <laughs> I said, don't be scared about that. I said, try first in your community. In Syria, we say, charity begins at home. That is Mendy. <laughs> so, so I hope, Prince, will help me to what? Charity, whatever you have to do, it has to start from your home. So let's start first where you are. So if you know that you've done it well in your community, people will say, but Chief, why did you come and educate us? Then the end, you have to move. I say, first, let's discuss what is, how far are you going to do it? So now he has divided the group into what? I said, OK, I want the soul. Because they say one way of spreading the disease is about secret society, about funerals. Because when these big people die, when the soul die, when the one big man of the society dies, what happens? All over the, com the country, if you remember, you go to that place. And when you got, get there, if you're not aware, if you don't know whether this, that person died of the disease, what happened? You will get it. If 100 people go, get the disease because of the enjoyment of the raw body, we we'll call it in Creole, raw body, body to body, what go? If 100 people get it, they go to the village, they go to the city, 
Some people come if, if paramount chief dies or if a chief dies, they come from Freetown to attend that funeral. And if the Sowe die, all the Sowe's in that region, it's a big Sowe, they will go there. And the ceremonies they do, probably there and they get the sickness. I said, okay, don't tell me what you do during the ceremony of the funeral and so forth. I don't want to know that. Because I want to respect their culture. I want to let them respect hold that culture. We don't want to know. Because if you go and tell me, if I'm a, so I'm a society woman, you come and tell me, how is the, so, uh, the, the, the women's society is? You are, if you are not a member, I will tell you what you want to know. But really what I know, I will not tell you because you are not part of me. So I said, we don't want to know that. You tell me, how do you have to prevent yourself? How? Because I, do, I know you have to touch the body, obviously. But how do you do so that you can't touch the body? Then the chief said, oh, Auntie Esther, when we are washing the body, we have a glove. I said, what is that glove? He it said it's made of cotton. I said, what happened with the water? I'm um, see the, the, the dialogue that is happening. Then he tells me that at times the water touch the body. I said, what do you do with the cloth? We we'll put it outside and put it back inside. I said, what are we going to do now in order not the water to touch you when you are doing? Then he started to say, uh, I think we need uh, boots, raincoats, gloves, and that rubber gloves and so forth. You see how they are, they are aware of it. But if you go and tell them that, they say we know already. Because there are little people in the community, they know they just need somebody to boost them up, to give them that confidence. So I think your question is very important. Now I'm now concentrating on the women. The women's society, we are in, if I go to any community as a member of this, of this and the society, as soon as I go, I say, Aijo. When I say Aijo, I wish there's somebody I can go back to my country and go and do this. If I say Aijo, they will understand what I'm doing. Because people, the women will have a way to prevent themselves. Because when, when a woman dies, the woman, the woman has to wash the body. <coughs> and the woman has to do all the cooking, clean the mess, children, chief. And when, the, the, who, who, uh, when a man dies, the role the man plays is to do the washing up and to do the, take the body and put it in the grave. So there is a way we can help this community. So your question is very important. Thank you. Um, Martin Bills. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, fascinating and uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, just uh, two uh, questions or comments. I mean, uh, one is on, uh, I mean, we talked about, you talked about spreading uh, and uh, why the disease has spread so quickly, but maybe we could, uh, I would be fascinated to hear you talk a little bit also about uh, various types of local resilience. Because obviously, I mean, um, I know this better in Liberia than in Sierra Leone, but uh, if you look at Liberia, I mean, Bapulu is quite easy to explain why it has not had have many cases due to the immense isolation of the place, which everybody knows about, which at least have tried to travel through it. Uh, but there are also other parts of uh, Liberia which are uh, not much affected at all. For instance, the Grand Gede, which is on the border towards uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but also t slightly towards the border of uh, Guinea. Hardly been any cases uh, at all. So there are huge variations, and not, uh, some of these variations are quite hard to explain. For, for instance, in Grand Gede, it may be that uh, the, for some reason, I mean, the very small health facilities that existed there were extremely proactive. I still don't have not really figured it out, but the, they started very early taking it taking tests, for instance, whereas other places in uh, Liberia, nothing happened, uh, happened at all. So uh, I would be fascinated to hear you have your comments about that. And also, if you have any comments concerning the um, so-called uh, national lockdown in, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, because at least to me, it was an attempt, I don't know if it actually achieved very much, but it was an attempt to at least show a government that was trying to do something, and it seems to me that it was that particular event was 
slight, at least to some some degree, well received by the uh, by the public. I mean, because if you compare that to the haphazard and quite violent quarantine slash lockdown of West Point in uh, Monrovia, where uh, riot police was needed and uh, nobody knew what was happening, at least the, uh, the national lockdown in uh, Sierra Leone was quite well communicated. And I think that part of the criticism that the Coroma government received from MSF was quite misplaced in my point of view. Thank you. Um, I'll answer that very briefly, Morton. Um, I agree with the analysis that you're sketching out. Um, the reason I'll answer it briefly is because we do have some anecdotal information, but if you ask an anthropologist to talk anecdotes, you'll be here for the rest of the evening. Um, so I can give you one or two examples, including one striking case that I think was reported in the Washington Post, I may be wrong, where it's, but it's been on the websites of a woman in Liberia who had some nursing background. I think this is probably the best of the anecdotes, so I will tell it. She had some nursing knowledge, so she knew the infection pathways, um, and she knew the importance of protection during the final eruptive phase of the disease. In her case, she nursed three members of her family with entirely improvised uh, material. So she used bin bag liners um, to protect herself and make makeshift gloves and so on, um, covered her face as best she could, um, controlled uh, what was happening to the sweat on her forehead. She, she'd worked it out, what the infection pathways were, and she was able to improvise solutions, and she nursed those three people back to, um, to health again. Now, that's the good news about Ebola, that about this epidemic in Upper West Africa. Uh, we've never seen an epidemic as large. It's truly frightening in its scale, but one of the things it's bringing out is that Ebola is actually much, much more survivable than any rubbish film by Hollywood that you've ever seen kind of thing. So forget the story that Ebola kills 90% of all the people that get the, the, the disease. Um, the current figures for, I think, the whole of the, the, the epidemic in West Africa, it kills about 30 to 40 percent. And MSF have published a very interesting, I think it was a letter to the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, in which they said the survival rate could be a lot higher if we used not rocket science techniques, because everyone is, is talking about you know, new vaccines and trialing new things and so on. Um, this is just good old... Uh, remedial practice. Treat it like a cholera epidemic. No one uh, recover. No, no, there are no drugs to cure you from cholera. Cholera is a, is a disease you have to ride out, but it's violently um, makes you violently ill. You vomit and you have unstoppable diarrhea and you die of dehydration, basically. And the final stages of Ebola become the final stages because rehydration is not taking place or not taking place fast enough. Sometimes there's organ failure if it's a very severe case, but the organ failure is in many cases uh, mitigated by um, rehydration. So taking ORT, oral rehydration therapy, uh, being on a drip, um, antibiotic care to prevent secondary infections and so on. MSF estimates that they could cut the death rate by a very significant uh, percentage. And people are proving that. These anecdotes are all, really all either cases of that kind that I've just given you or else they're self-quarantining options that may be happening in Grand Jide and other places where local rulers are saying, OK, we've understood the risk. Now we're going to close the roads and no one is coming in. Uh, the best example in Sierra Leone is Koinadugu district where a returning diaspora son of the soil in Kabala, went to the local chiefs and said, we've got to cut down the rate at which people move in and out of this district. And I think even now the, the district has only had a handful of cases. What they did was they organized a fleet of lorries. Instead of having any Joe drive up and down the road in his truck delivering things and fetching fresh vegetables out of Konadugu to Freetown, they had a fleet of six lorries. The drivers were forbidden to carry passengers. And they took all, anything that anyone had to sell or move into Koinadugu district came in those six lorries. And that way they protected the whole district from any serious, um, so far, God protect them, um, any serious outbreak of the disease. So we know that there are these local initiatives going on and that explains, I think, some of the spotty 
variation that, that you're getting. But it all adds up to good news, which is that Ebola is preventable. And it doesn't, you don't have to wait for MSF and a hospital to appear on your doorstep to prevent it. You can start doing the sort of things that Esther's been talking about and let it come from the people themselves because it will spread much more effectively that way than if you're telling them to wear rubber gloves. Let them figure it out for themselves and be ready with the rubber gloves and the sweat bands and so on to, to give them when they start to ask for them. Thank you. Uh, we now have another handful of questions. Uh, Vincent? Thank you. That was very interesting and a very new world for me as an East Africanist without familiarity with, uh, with Ebola. My, I've got two linked questions about the relationship to AIDS, really. Um, I mean, what, one, it seems to me you can learn a lot from the 30 years or so of anthropology of AIDS yes. for this. I mean, about, about small things like funeral sexuality or rural urban travel and so on. But also, and I would I like you to, to maybe comment on that, but my other question related to that is whether or not also can learn from the AIDS anthropology that there can be a lot of misplaced anthropology. You know, in, in AIDS we have had 20 years of studies of who has sex with whom, uh, you know, who does what, all on the ground level. And only in the last 10 years or so we realized that, that anthropology could contribute something really at much higher levels, at the levels of bureaucracy and administration, uh, medical institutions, medical research, science, rather than at the ground level that so op often is suggested as the key domain of anthropologists. I mean, ultimately, what, what brought AIDS transmission down is not anthropological studies of, of sexual behavior and why one uses condoms or not, but that people realize they die. And um, I wonder whether one couldn't also learn from that, because it seems to me as if an able anthropology there's also a tendency to focus very much on local custom and you know, ground level, apparent ground level practices. Um, I agree with a lot of that. And uh, indeed, in Guinea, the, um, because French francophone anthropologists and French anthropologists, they just happen to have a strong group of people who've worked on HIV AIDS in West Africa. Uh, and they contribute a great deal to the current debate because they've got a model to, to work with. Where I think the AIDS model may be misleading is in the idea that you, with, with AIDS it's a very slow disease process and people have got time, as it were, to figure out what's going on and to change their practices and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas Ebola is very dramatic and very sudden. And the difference between living and dying, uh, at least according to the medical model, is if you report ahead of your symptoms, if you, can, if you can move your reporting to a proper Ebola barrier nursing facility, if you can move it from phase three, which is never going to happen unless you're dragged there in a hammock, to phase two when you're still just about mobile, you, know, you might live. Um, so Esther was in this meeting with the chief gov government scientist at DFID the other day. We're, we're all there because we have an anthropology platform that advises the chief scientist. And um, he's in charge of sort of designing or at least signing off the, the British plan for assistance in Sierra Leone. So Esther started to say, well, if we had a system in which people who were falling ill in villages um, were observed for, say, up to a week, and if they're still ill, that's, that's probably a sign that they've got Ebola, not just malaria, um, and that's the point at which to move them. And Chris Whitty, the chief scientist, laughed, and he said, we, we ain't got a week. He said, it's two days. You know, if you don't move that person, if we can't close that gap, um, that person is going to be seriously in danger of, of dying if they then develop the third phase of the disease. So... Going the, 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 the same three phases probably could be assigned to HIV AIDS over five years, ten years, whatever. But here we're talking about a three phase of disease in which you've got two days, two days, two days to do something, and that's it. Um, so I think that makes a big difference logistically. Um, and I welcome the AIDS model, and I do agree with your point also about analyzing large-scale institutional structures, but not at the expense of the local stuff, because a lot of what anthropologists ought to know but don't know is the material culture of household cleanliness. And I told that story about Mary Douglas almost as a way of perhaps criticizing 
Mary herself, who is a wonderful figure and important in inspiration to my own knowledge of anthropology and thinking on the subject. But Mary would fiddle around with symbolic details, like whether you went to the upstairs toilet or the downstairs toilet. Whereas what we're dealing with here is what I call bucket aid. We did a survey of all the villages I showed you around the Gola Forest. Of, we did a household inventory. Not every household has one bucket. If you've got an Ebola patient, you need two buckets at least. You know, just think of the mess that you're dealing with. Um, and it's not difficult to position hundreds of thousands or millions if necessary, you know, give everyone buckets. That, that would be my proposal six weeks ago was that we just simply gave everyone lots of buckets and lots of rubber gloves and maybe you could throw in some goggles as well. That would come in handy. Um, it wasn't well received. Um, this is not how doctors think. It's not what you do as a doctor giving out free buckets. But the, the point is that the, if, if, if anyone's to tell the medical professionals what, what it is that they need to know, it's anthropologists, but anthropologists have not actually, by and large, observed these things. Now, take the funeral issue. A lot of stress has been placed upon the alleged esoteric practices of West African families in burying their loved ones, and stories about you know, body hugging and so on. The meeting I've just described was held in a room in Diffid, which is 22 Whitehall, which happened to be the house. It happened to be the very room in which the body of Lord Nelson was... Um, placed prior to his funeral after the Battle of Trafalgar. I don't know whether you know that story. There's no reason why Norwegians should. But his body was pickled in brandy for the voyage back from Trafalgar. Several weeks it took. The brandy's quite famous because the sailors were drinking it, siphoning it off the, the corpse. No, no, the, the official story from the Admiralty is that the brandy was being replaced um, because it needed to be aerated. The unofficial story is that the sailors were drinking the brandy meanwhile. And then I just happened to notice in this room as we were all assembling, there was a description of this famous event, the lying in state of the body in this room. And it described how hundreds of Lord Nelson's admirers came into the room and embraced the body. Ah, this just sounded like these bizarre accounts that we've been getting in the newspapers about what allegedly West Africans do to hug and kiss dead bodies and say farewell to them. But that's not, there's no rituals of, of that kind that we know about. And if, if they are, then they're secrets, as Esther has explained. No, what, what's happening is, is that anybody needs to be prepared for a funeral. You're not going to bury it in the condition it's, it's died in, especially not with a hemorrhagic virus fever. Um, so you're going to be washing it. And body washing is just mundane. It's so mundane, no anthropologist would deign to, apart from Marianne Fermer, who has actually described body washing and where it happens and how it happens and what happens to the mud that's taken from under the body, which does have a, a symbolic purpose. It's used for anointing widows so that they can later be washed to be freed from the ghost of their dead husband and so on. Obviously, that is a very dangerous practice. What we were told, or what Esther was told when she was talking to some of these people in our her pilot village, um, the chief said, yes, we will change funeral practices once we understand the risk, provided that we can bury with respect. That was the key thing. And there was one woman crying on television on BBC. She was being interviewed in Freetown, and they said the, 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 these body people, they came in in their frightening suits to grab the body of my dead husband, even before I could grab a camera to make a photograph of him so that I could talk about him to the children later. And it would be very simple to send a photographer around with a, bu a burial team. You know, memento mori photographs are part of the culture of death in West Africa since the 19th centuries. But regular part of everyday photograph professional photography to make photographs of dead bodies dressed up for a funeral so that the, the family has a memento. And that's the sort of information that anthropologists need to feed into the process. It's really mundane stuff. It ain't rocket science, they say. Mm -hmm. So I will insist that there is a role for that detailed level of practical, but it's the material culture of, of domestic cleanliness that we're talking about here. It isn't the ritual, symbolic dimension. 
Thank you. I think this is uh, this is essential knowledge if you if we're going to begin to know how to learn how to deal with the uh, Ebola phenomenon. Um, unfortunately, we uh, we don't have a lot of time left for this meeting. I know there's a number of people who want to ask questions, but I don't think we have time for more than two. So, Robert and the gentleman next to him, uh, would you like to ask your questions, and then maybe Paul can sum it up afterwards? Give a one minute. Uh, give a one word answer to each question. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> We don't want that. We, we want real answers. But uh, Robert first, and then the gentleman next. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think it opens up like a whole range of interesting discussions. Um, but to come back to Thomas' comment in the beginning about trust, um, the focus was a bit on, on the, the trust towards expats or towards uh, foreigners. Um, and the second question after that was about the role of the paramount chiefs or the role of the chiefs and the elders. Um, and I found there's somehow a kind of an emphasis on trust and respect towards these elders and these chiefs. Whereas you often see that uh, people are very skeptical about uh, what the chiefs are currently doing um, and how they are appropriating the, uh, the Ebola virus for uh, certain personal gains. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on that, and then especially thinking about uh, the aftermath of Ebola and how people will take this discussion up once the virus has settled down and uh, maybe other uh, social political problems are uh, uh, staged. Yeah. We take the next. Yeah, so you can just, thank you. Yes, my name is Brad Taylor. I'm also from Sierra Leone. I live in Norway. And um, I must thank the speaker for enlightening us and giving us an interesting aspect of the situation of Ebola in Sierra Leone. Um, however, there are two, three points which I think are quite important, which I would like to mention here. Um, the first is that um, actually one of the reasons why we have so much problem with e Ebola is not that it is such a contagious disease, but one, um, the authorities were very slow in realizing what was happening. And two, um, the public health facilities were of such a nature that um, it actually provided genuine grounds for people to be suspicious. We all mention in suspicion, yeah, it's very important. There are many reasons for it, political and all, but there are also medical reasons. For example, up till now, it is very difficult to say, um, separate patients that have Ebola from those who have normal illnesses. Mm -hmm. In fact, two days ago, a Leone doctor died mm -hmm. because he treated a patient who came in and he didn't know that patient had Ebola. Um, so that these there are also genuine reasons why people have that. The third thing is that um, this disease is actually very little contagious, but it is causing so much panic. Many people have suggested political reasons for this, but um, I think also we have to consider the fact that people knew that in Kenema, the American army had a research center. This is not to be refuted mm -hmm. since 2002. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Khan's report actually mentioned he had discovered Ebola in people, but a very mild sort. People were getting a bit of a fever, but not actually dying from it or actually getting real ill from it. So people knew that. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is that um, when you bring your loved ones to hospital and then come out, leave that person there and that person dies there because they've had contact with Ebola patients and it's a very quick death. So there are many reasons, but um, of course, we have very little time. I could have mentioned many things. But one thing I would like to mention also is that it seems Ebola does not kill animals that produce vitamin C, mm. which is very interesting line of discussion instead of doing all this vaccine production and all this sort of thing that one could follow, for example, giving simple vitamin C to, to in very high doses to people. Uh, during the days of AIDS, it was done before all the antiviral. antiviral. Okay. Um, so. I, I agree with a lot of both the, the, the questions. Um, so I'll not say more than I agree with the 
points made. Um, I think there is still an issue that is unresolved about trust. And that, the bit I skipped over in the paper, it's in our paper, though not very extensively discussed, uh, but I didn't discuss at all in this presentation, is the information that we collected from our random sample of 47 chiefdoms, 2,400 households, um, on the degree to which people trust different authorities and to whom they turn in times of difficulty. And you saw the curves showing that they're very weighted towards the local level. The more local you get, the more people trust. And basically, in some cases, the only people they trust are their families, which is what is so cruel about the disease, because it's the very lack of breakdown of trust of the families. If it was just individual survival, the best survival strategy would be for people to run away from their sick relatives. Um, but people, uh, thank God, Sierra Leoneans are very, very reluctant to do that. In urban areas, you get a few cases where bodies are tipped out onto the street. Probably it's landlords trying to protect their business. They don't want the other tenants to say, okay, there was a bit of Ebola death in this house. Let's, let's, let's um, flee and not pay the rent. But in rural areas, people will stick by their loved ones through thick and thin. And I find that absolutely wonderful. But of course, it also puts them in appalling danger, which is why, to my mind, there is an ethical imperative on the entire medical profession to come up with, OK, they don't like me using the word home care, but I, I will call it a risk reduction protocol for people who have to do in situ nursing who haven't got a facility or the facility is not fit for purpose uh, to take it to because a lot of the disease has been spread by hospitals um, and so people are rightly very suspicious about hospitals um, and the trust that they have is very locally focused. Now I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction between saying that in some chiefdoms paramount chiefs are seen more as part of government than they are of the community. That is true. And I'm prepared to bet that, as in the war, there's quite a number of paramount chiefs who fled their chiefdoms and they're now in America or Britain or, or wherever. Um, so we know that chieftaincy has been breaking down in the country for a number of years, especially since there have been a lot of paramount chiefs elected who have been really living in the diaspora for 30 years. And when they come back, they're not totally reintegrated within their society. But in other cases, you find paramount chiefs who have been there year on year. Some even stayed in their chiefdoms during the war when the rebels were hunting down paramount chiefs and wanting to kill them. Uh, yesterday BBC had a news item from the chieftain that's right close to Lungi Airport and the main protagonist of the news item was the paramount chief who was standing in the middle of this Ebola affected community saying where are the government facilities, where are the ambulances, where are the burial teams, none of this is coming, I'm trying to get food for these orphan kids who've lost their parents, where's World Food Programme and so on and so forth. So we know that some paramount chiefs are taking a very crucial role in, in offering local leadership just as I know one paramount chief in, chief in the middle of the country who stayed with his people, even though he was 78 years old, he led his own Kamajor fighters from the front, was wounded in battle, and never left his chiefdom right through the length of the Civil War. So it's a very varied picture, and you work with the, the, the authorities that are most trusted, but, but finding that it doesn't cover the whole country, so there are some gaps. Um, but Often head, headmen, headwomen, uh, town chiefs, whatever you call them, the very local level of chiefdom, chief, chief, what we found is that they are absolutely vital in terms of dispute settlement. They're highly respected because they have to be effective day on day. So they're in touch with their people directly. They're not very high in the political hierarchy, so they don't have any influence on government. But they are living with their people, and they suffer with them, and they are capable of doing some of the things that need now to be done in terms of local mobilization. Passing of local bylaws is something that could well be attempted to say, 
you know, how we're going to, once you've decided how you want to quarantine people and who's going to do the nursing and so on, you pass local bylaws and says that everyone's involved, we're taxing everybody, you have to come with a cup of rice to provide for the people who are nursing the Ebola victims and so on and so forth. And there's evidence that that is happening. And it could lead to a real revival of local chieftaincy. I don't say necessarily at the level of paramount chieftaincy, but at the level of effective day-to-day -day chieftaincy. Um, where, you know, every day problems are brought to these chiefs and they try and solve them as best they can. Now Ebola is their biggest challenge ever. And uh, I, I don't see any contradiction in trying to channel support to that level of the system to get bottom-up response to the disease, while at the same time admitting that there are lots of problems with the institutional level um, I don't think the Sierra Leone government's record, incidentally, is as bad as some governments, and uh, it's, we unseemly to get involved in, you know, calling names and judging who's been effective. But I, I would say that, although ev everyone was slow, because the international community wasn't expecting it, the medical experts didn't diagnose it quickly enough. So, okay, the Sierra Leone government was very slow to recognise the problem, but they're. they're WHO, who should have been advising the government and telling them this is serious, get your act together, do something about it, they were pathetically slow as well. So I think in terms of your criticism, um, it, it's true, but I wouldn't stop at the government of Sierra Leone. I would start also to query the way in which some of the international institutions have responded. And indeed, WHO have admitted. They've said, we, we failed. We, we got it wrong in the early days. We didn't listen to advice. MSF warned us. And we now need to deal with the consequences of that uh, in the future. Thank you. So perhaps uh, in the future we will be able not least thanks to, to this wonderful, rich and uh, um, enlightening lecture to get things slightly better, slightly more right in the future maybe. So uh, before you go, um, well thank you so much, and, but before you go I'd like to thank a few other people for having made this event possible. I mean I've already thanked Helge Wehm, okay, for having the idea. And of course, uh, Paul and Esther for, for being here and uh, enriching our understanding very substantially about this uh, huge humanitarian crisis. Um, but uh, this is also a joint uh, event, okay? Organized jointly by Overheating, that's us, okay? Department of Social Anthropology, that's also sort of us, okay? But also some others. And the Faculty of Social Sciences. Uh, and the reason why this has been such a success is largely due to the efforts of, of two people, okay? So I'd just like to thank those two people at the end uh, because of their enthusiasm their energy and their reliability in making this happen and making the event known. So I'd like to thank Irene Svarteng, who's here at our department and overheating, and Grulien Garbo, who's sitting behind her in charge of communication, for having uh, made this uh, uh, possible in practice. And thanks again for Paul and Esther for, for being here and uh, teaching us important things and uh, deepening our understanding of what's going on in the, in the Upper Guinea Coast. And let's just hope for the best. So, and thanks everybody for being here, for coming. <laughs>